We're probably the best royalty company in the space in terms of business model. The ability to actually execute is there because we have a technical team. We're a focus on high quality assets. We're a focus on premium strategies. We're a focus on making sure that we run the best royalty company in the world. How do you give sight to the market of when you actually start making money? I get one and a half percent dividends, fantastic, best paying in the sector, but where's the inflection point come? Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. First of all, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like it, give us a thumbs up. That helps us to understand if this company is someone that you want to spend our time, money and effort on for you. Uh, also, if you could leave your comments below, it helps us understand the sorts of questions you think we should be asking, how you think we've done, and of course, what you think of a Cisco Gold Royalties. Uh, you can catch this as a podcast, an article or a transcription on cruxinvestor.com. And for our Crux Investor Club members, you get early access to this video. And if you haven't already done so, please click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, for more videos like this, click the notification bell. We spoke earlier today to Sean Rosen, who's the CEO of Cisco Gold Royalties. They're on the NYSE and also on the TSX. They are ostensibly a royalty company, but there's a private equity component to this. They have an accelerator program. So it's confusing the market somewhat. Uh, we talked to him today uh, about whether he understands, recognizes and acknowledges that. And then if so, what he's doing about it. It seems there's been a management change. Uh, they're going through the process of cleaning up and separating church from state. That was a phrase he used, which I quite liked. Um, and hopefully getting out to the market with a much more simplified message. I back to basics, please. Um, lots discussed. Very interesting uh, individual. Uh, and I quite liked the approach. Uh, so take a look in the description below at some of the topics we discuss. Anything interesting in particular, click on the number beside that uh, topic. That's called a timestamp. I'll jump you through to that part of the video. Otherwise, enjoy what Sean has to say. Sean, how are you doing, sir? I am living well in the COVID-19 retreat here at the uh, Lake House in Muskoka. Oh, sounds tough already. Lake House. So have you, have you, got, you got yourself a boat up there as well? Are you, you enjoying yourself? I have several of them, actually. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a vintage kind of guy. So they're all old wooden boats from the 1940s and 50s. So what do you got, like schooners? What, what, do, you, what do you use up there? No, it's here in, uh, in Ontario. We have uh, old wooden mahogany boats. So I've got a, a few of those. My pride and joy is a 38 footer that's sitting out in front of the dock right now. So All right. after this, I will go drive around very slowly, looking good and, and going slow. Nice, nice. Are you into Rivas? Do you like a Riva? Uh, there's a few Rivas on the lake, but I tend to be uh, more of a nationalist. I tend to only buy Canadian boats. Oh boy, right. I think that gives us a taste of what's to come. Okay. <laughs> so why don't we start off and give us a one minute I'm cheap too. You che I, I doubt it, Sean. I doubt it. Why, why do you give us a one minute overview of a Cisco Gold Royalties and then we'll pick it up from there? Certainly. So Cisco Gold Royalties is the product of Cisco One, which was a, a company that I created with my private equity group, Eurasia Holdings. Uh, we founded a Cisco One in 2003. Uh, we bought the Canadian Malartic uh, mine in uh, 2004 for $88,888. Uh, we invested $1.2 billion in that project. It sits between Goldex uh, that belongs to Agnico and, and the Laurent mine that belongs to Agnico in the Abitibi in Quebec. And uh, we started drilling there. We put 1.2 million meters of drilling in in phase one, and we built Canada's largest producing gold mine. Um, and we uh, produce about 700,000 ounces of gold, uh, and it's uh, one of the top, most important gold mines in the world. We sold that to Agnico, Agnico and Yamana in 2014 uh, for $4.3 billion, and we spun out of Cisco Gold Royalties, which its only active asset, uh, asset was a 5% top-line royalty uh, on the Canadian Malartic Mine, which gives us about 35,000 ounces of zero cost, 100% margin gold, uh, which was the founding asset to the company. Uh, subsequently to 2014, we did an acquisition uh, uh, based strategy, uh, which was to acquire uh, and, and grow and gross up the, the royalty portfolio. We now have 137 assets with 16 producing assets. Uh, so from four non-producing and one producing to 137 with 16 producing. And the company IPO'd at about $490 million market cap, currently sits at about $2.5 billion. And the main strategy of a Cisco Gold Royalties was to do what we did before, which was to take our senior group of engineers and geologists and incubate projects, take a, a royalty and stream in what we call our accelerator process, 
and to build an organically growing portfolio uh, from, you know, from, from basically from home cooking, from projects that we generated ourselves. So quite a bit different in terms of strategy from the existing, you know, buy things on the open market, overpay for them. Uh, so we targeted more like private equity returns in our portfolio of accelerator group companies. And we generated seven sidecar companies uh, to that, the most successful having been uh, obviously a Cisco mining with the windfall project in Northern Quebec, uh, which uh, in 2016 had an $8 million market cap and no projects. And we did an acquisition strategy with that company, which we backed by royalty and streaming financings, which is now trading $1.4 billion. And we paid uh, very little for a one of the more significant royalties on that windfall deposit, uh, sitting at 2.5% now. Uh, so we've continued to grow our portfolio. We are a hybrid. Uh, we're a little different than the other royalty companies, and we tend to target much higher returns. Uh, we're dominantly brownfield Canadian specialists. Uh, we've worked internationally. We have about 3,500 due diligence files from our, our previous careers. Um, so we bring that to bear for our shareholders, and I think we, we drive a, a much higher return business than the traditional royalty model. Okay. So we, we've spoken to quite a few royalty companies recently. We're trying to work out the kind of North American model and obviously big, big onus on precious metals, which is great at the moment. You know, gold, gold's up. You know, I think you'd met yourself, you know, the, the company has been doing quite well since the gold started p- picking up last August, September. Um, but you've got a lot of moving parts now. You've reached that size where it's complex. You've got to find new ways of competing. You've also got to find new ways of communicating to shareholders what it is that the plan is. So if you don't mind, can we can we talk a little bit about what the plan is? Because day one, it would have been very different from where you are now. You, you, you've got lots of options. You've got lots of deals on the table. So how does this thing move forward? So our incubation uh, you know, was a spin out from the sale of, of Canada's largest gold mine and the 10th largest gold mine in the world. So we came out with a cornerstone asset that's unlike anything that other, any of the other startup uh, royalty uh, companies had. So we, we started out, you know, if for lack of a better metaphor, on third base. Um, and, you know, we, we really drove on our, our skill set, which was to incubate our own opportunities uh, and take royalties early on. So we, we have a, a really simple AUM allocation process where we dedicate 25% of our investments um, Sorry, I obviously got a phone call that uh, I misattended to, and 75 to our accelerator model, and 75 percent um, to traditional royalty investments where we participate in bank run and corporate M and A backings and and that kind of a strategy. So our corporate strategy has really been around the fact that we can create a higher return level on the royalties that we generate ourselves, um, and we've done so several times now. The most successful being Arizona Mining. Um, where we were very earlier to the, the stage. It was an asset that we knew and understood. We took a 1% royalty for $10 million at the very beginning, and we own 5.6% of the equity. Uh, we sold the equity when uh, when uh, South 32 took us out for a profit of $34 million, uh, which more than paid for the $10 million that we paid for the royalty, and the royalty is now worth $80 million. So our returns are in the 1,000, 4 to 5,000% range on those kind of deals when we do them. Uh, but it requires that we're we're a little bit more knowledgeable, a little more technical, um, and we carry a little bit of a heavier technical team than some of the other groups. Um, but you know, one or two of those deals a year uh, tend to more than offset our increased GNA. Um, in terms of how we fit in, we're the fourth largest precious metal royalty company in the world right now. Uh, last year, we made 146 million dollars in gross revenue with a 91% gross margin. We're dominantly royalties, and we're dominantly royalties on gold mines that are pure gold mines as opposed to offtakes on copper mines and we're dominantly exposed to Canadian assets. Okay, so you've just you've just done your annual 2020 um, uh, shareholder meeting. You're predominantly institutional, but 25%, which is described as retail and unknown institutional. So it, it's there's not much. Li- is there much liquidity in the stock? I know you've got it's traded a lot, but the shares don't seem to move too much. Do you think shareholders are happy at the moment? I think that, you know, obviously we uh, we run a different business model. So some of the groups that have been ascribing the pure royalty model have run higher multiples on their NAV basis. Um, so we do face a challenge in terms of the diversity that we have within our business strategy. Um, but I've been doing this a long time. I started as an underground miner in 1985. 
Uh, I've seen most of the mines in the world and I've worked 16 years as an international expat. So we're a focus on high quality assets. We're a focus on premium strategies. Uh, and we try not to get up caught up in these bank run strategies that are more you know, flavor du jour as opposed to true value building. Um, so we'll stay the course. Um, we, uh, we, we've built a really good portfolio of North American assets. We think that political risk matters. Uh, having thir spent 13 years in West Africa, been through four hostage takings, two civil wars, uh, and multiple other uh, security issues, um, it's a real thing for us. Um, so, you know, we're dominantly focused on places where we think we can, uh, we can actually operate these mines. And, you know, in the incubation process, uh, we've had exceptional success uh, in the last uh, six years. Our group of companies and the subset was responsible for more than 50 percent of all the exploration drilling in Canada, uh, led the charge by a Cisco mining, uh, which has drilled 1.3 million meters. And our shareholders did not pay for that. But we uh, we hold royalties on almost 30,000 square kilometers of lands uh, in brownfield camps in Canada. And I kind of like to think about it like real estate. It's a, you know, there's waterfront and there's downtown core. Um, they don't make new waterfront. They don't they make new downtown core. So we've stuck to premium real estate. And we think that in the, in the medium to long term, our strategy pays off. It's a little bit, it's been a little bit complicated to explain to shareholders in the near term. But I think that our product um, for those who do the work, uh, it is a, it is a little slightly more sophisticated project than the, uh, than to go to bid, you know, pay one and a half times NAV. You know, if you're paying a dollar fifty for a dollar worth of revenue, um, I don't know that that game lasts forever. Uh, so we've been very much the primary basic investor. Got it. Okay. So, ask you the question: Do you think they're happy? You didn't say yes. You gave me a qu you, you yeah, tried I think to they, elaborate. People like the strategy are very happy. Right. Okay. Which is what? Do you think the institutional guys like it and understand it, and they're in for the long term? Well, listen, our, our main shareholders are the Case Depot in Quebec um, and Investment Quebec and uh, FTQ uh, and then some of the traditional players like Tocqueville. Uh, they get it and they understand it. Um, you know, obviously, uh, communication to uh, to get a premium on the company uh, is my challenge. And uh, Sandeep Singh and we've had a management change in the company in 2019. Uh, so uh, Sandeep's the new president and uh, we've we've. We re-ramped, re-energized everybody um, as we came into it. So I think we're we're in that position right now where there's a value gap in the market for shareholders that are looking for a royalty company to come into. Uh, we do face the lowest multiple with the highest quality of assets out of all the royalty companies that are out there. So it's a, it's a bargain opportunity if you uh, if you do the work and you can understand it. And we're, we're more than happy to talk to you and, and take you through it. But uh, it's a big, solid you know, what I would call in North American terms, an F-150 uh, kind of portfolio. It's very straightforward. It's not complicated uh, at the asset level. Uh, we don't have a lot of exotic things in there. Um, and, you know, what has been exotic has been discounted already, uh, such as Lydian or, or our, our investment in Renard, uh, Quebec's largest diamond mine. Uh, everything else is basically in there for free. And if you can just believe in the fundamentals, the Canadian Malartic asset, obviously being our cornerstone uh, project, um, and you know Agnico having just announced seven million ounces in the underground, of which we have a five percent royalty on, you know we we continue to have premium assets. So I think that's the opportunity for shareholders. Okay, so you're not a conventional royalty company per se. You have this kind of private equity approach to some of your investing okay because you uh -huh. then get the private equity type percent and my having come from private equity if if you if it was anything under 20 percent, i wasn't really interested so it gets significantly more than you'd expect from the royalty but higher risk you've got to know what you're investing into at that point right is that a fair point yeah i mean we tend to uh we like to eat our own cooking so you know in the case of uh barker uh which has been the more controversial acquisition that we did last year um it's an asset where we Put our own management team in. Chris Loader is, a, is part of the Cisco platform. He became CEO. Uh, we executed 500,000 meters of drilling under his uh, supervision. I was chairman. Uh, we pulled that down to the asset base because we felt that, uh, that that there was a big value gap there for our shareholders. So we we looked at it more like a private equity investment and said there's there's a you know there's a good chance that we'll have a 20% plus return on this asset. So we'll pull that in because the market hasn't recognized it. Um, so we're in the process right now of financing that project to the next level, but it's a 
2,300 square kilometer land package. It's a mining camp, not just a project uh, with multiple mines. And the vision for that one is that we end up with five to 10 mines with a central processing facility. And the Cisco royalty shareholders uh, may end up with a, a royalty that's somewhat competitive uh, to the Canadian Malartic royalty, which is probably considered to be the best royalty in the world, delivering about 35,000 ounces a year of zero cost gold. Um, there are streams that are bigger, but there are very few royalties that are bigger than that. So our goal has been to look and, you know, not to get caught with the rats and mice and lots of people who are taking pieces and parts of things and, and paying for them with stock. We've just stuck to primary business uh, and tried to be more disciplined in our asset acquisitions, focused on when we see something big, we want to bear down on it. Um, and we want to exploit that for their, our shareholders' benefit and uh, to be greedy on their behalf in terms of quality assets. Okay. Again, I'm just, I'm just trying to really deconstruct and simplify this. So I guess 16 producing assets, 16 near-term producing assets following up at some point. So that's the kind of conventional component. The private equity thing, I get that you're going big when you do go, but you can understand why people looking at your if you started off as a royalty company it's in the title of the company why they might be confused or might not do the homework to try and understand what it is that you do your background is private equity so therefore you've got a natural penchant for that but the market doesn't necessarily have that so what is it that attracts you to it is it this long term or medium term large private equity type returns that you think will smooth the kind of curves or why do it at all? Why not spin it out? Why not do that elsewhere? Well, we we are in the process. When we did the acquisition of Arkerville, we announced the North Spirit uh, Discovery Group, which is intended to be a traditional uh, private equity group. We're in the process right now. Uh, when we bought that Barkerville asset, we had 5 million ounces of gold in the ground, but we think that there's potential there for significantly more. It's an 83 kilometer long mineralized trend. So we really thought this is a company company maker asset. We've been in the process of, of looking for an asset uh, partner on that, and you know the Cisco Gold Royalties would benefit from being an owner in the in the private equity group at the GP level, uh, as well as retaining a five percent royalty on all of those potential projects. You know, with the starter asset being the uh, the current resource, uh, which is we announced the PA on last fall, uh, and we think that you know as we evolve through this. Um, it should happen. The strange thing that happened, of course, is we bought the asset at $1,300 gold and gold has broken loose since we bought it. So we've had multiple partners coming in, but uh, you know, time has been our friend as we, as, as we looked at all these uh, potential partners to come into it. Um, so obviously we're trying to choose our fight date properly in terms of bringing in that investment partner into the story. And I think you'll see us get that done uh, before the end of the year. We had a little bit of delay, obviously, to COVID-19, as one does. But I'm pretty excited about the value that's been created there. It is in the permitting track. It's 18 months out from permitting. You know, public hearings have been held. IBAs are near completion. There's a lot of risk-off stuff that's happening to that project. It could be a serious drive to confirm our accelerator model for the Cisco royalty shareholders that, uh, you know, we've done it again. I mean, they've seen it do, us do it before. Um, obviously, Windfall Lake being the biggest success, you know, having having taken that from an eight million dollar company, raised seven hundred million dollars of flow through money to go drill, and creating one of the highest grade discoveries in the world right now uh, at uh, five million ounces, eight point nine grams. So we've been down this track before, and 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 we think that we can continue to deliver on it. Um, but it does make shareholders somewhat nervous while we're doing it. Uh, so I'm trying to mitigate the risk for shareholders in a traditional royalty model. And obviously, this has rattled the establishment of royalty companies because they're all about uh, not having you know too much risk on their balance sheets. Um, but we've generated significantly higher returns, and we've been able to grow faster than any other royalty company okay. uh, in the space over the last five years. Okay, so who's going to run that? So right now, it's uh, it's you know we have a uh, Luke Lassard who uh, was the mine builder for Cambior, and he built our Canadian Arctic mine. He's built eleven mines in the past. So he's on the engineering side, uh, uh, framed up by Francois Vesna, uh, and a, a bunch of other guys that worked with us on mine builds in the past. Uh, we do have a history amongst the group. We've built 14 mines. Um, so we have quite a bit of depth on the bench when it comes to the chief operating officer on down. Uh, from the financial side, we've got uh, Sandeep Singh, who has taken over as president for Cisco Gold Royalties, one of the more exceptional 
uh, M&A bankers that started his own firm called uh, called, called uh, Maxit, um, came out of Dundee and BMO and was an advisor to us. Uh, so he's running a lot of the day-to-day royalty business and I've been focused on uh, you know, trying to make sure that we have the proper engineering and financial backing uh, for that. Um, but we'll have a market presence. We have John Brzezinski who's running uh, Cisco Mining right now. Uh, who's in the repertoire of Bob Wares, who was a co- we were all co-founders of a Cisco One. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, credible senior uh, CEO level people within the group, and we tend to hunt as a pack. Okay, but you, you tell me there about growth, and you're the, you know, you're the best, you've got the best growth numbers, and that's fantastic. And you give me examples of the success stories, but mining's a tough industry, things don't always go right. You know, and I, you know, how do you give sight to the market of when you actually start making money? I get one and a half percent dividends, fantastic, best paying in the sector. But what do companies of your size do to grow and be profitable? What do you have to invest in to, uh, you know, go to the next level to become the ten billion dollar company, not the two billion dollar company? Because it seems you're kind of at the moment in a, in a holding pe- period. Where's the inflection point come? Well, I think from us, it comes from the, you know, the evolution of our development projects turning into mines. And, you know, we've got, a, if we continue to build out all the projects that are in our development and growth portfolio, we go from 80,000 ounces a year of GEOs to about 150 to 200,000 ounces just on what's already in the company. So if the Cisco Gold Royalties don't make another single investment, uh, we would double in size in our royalty portfolio and dominantly on premium Canadian assets. Uh, where we benefit because, you know, if there's an exploration dollar is going to be spent in the world, it will go into a Canadian project because we have the flow through share program here and we have low cost exploration. We have a lot of land on which we can work and our drill costs are about a third what they are in Mexico, Peru or or a fifth of what they are in Africa. Um, you know, so we, we have the ability to generate significant wealth from the existing portfolio um, and then obviously you know, we have the ability to grow and we have the benefit of contacts, context in that, you know, it's a senior management team that's mostly driven technically and complemented by some of the best financial people that have walked the, uh, walked the space in recent time. So, you know, I've been trying to build the, uh, the you know, and to the, the perfect scenario and, and, and uh, you know, to wait for the Oracle of Omaha's fat pitch, um, that if we do take a swing at something, it's for good reason. And we're trying to bat 400 plus uh, as we come in to the to the cycle. Obviously, we're in a peak gold market, so asset acquisition becomes very competitive. The good news for us is we've already completed most of our acquisition strategy. So now comes the cycle when those mines get built and there's access to capital. So I think we're pretty well perched. It's going to take us another 18 to 24 months uh, to daylight a lot of the value that's there. But most of our projects are developing, and you know, Victoria Gold is a great example. Um, that was, a, you know, I would call that a 400 sort of pitch that, um, you know, came out as everybody else hated the project. Uh, we led the charge on the financing. We put up $100 million for a 5% royalty on the top line and subsequently $70 million in equity partnered with our friends from Orion Mine Finance. And it's currently the largest gold mine ever built in the history of the Yukon. It's the largest gold mine commissioning in Canada right now on heap leach uh, at 64 and a half degrees latitude just off the Arctic Circle. And, you know, we're looking forward to that being our next growth asset going to 10,000 ounces a year. Okay. So I mean, you, what you're saying is our acquisition um, program is almost finished. We're going to s- sit back, breathe, have take stock, take a look at what we're actually doing at the moment and try and create value going forward. We're not going to keep spending. Because if I look at your yeah. finances, you're sitting on... I, I, don't, I don't really like the word try. I said we are because we're not that kind of... We're not a group that tries. We do. <laughs> okay. You're going to. You're going to take stock and you're going to do this. Right. Okay. You're with me now. Okay. Okay. Send me the t-shirt. Uh, so, but if I look at your finances, you got 423 million bucks of debt as of March. I don't know what it stands at today. You've got a big credit yeah. facility, which you've drawn down 92 million of. Um, talk to me about the finances and what you're going to do. Do you need to clean things up? Because you're telling me there's a lot of money coming down the line. Yeah, I mean, we uh, we have, you know, net income of over $100 million a year right now. Um, we did draw down fifty million dollars from our from our facility uh, during COVID nineteen when we didn't know which way the world was going, 
Uh, subsequent to that, Investment Quebec, the government of Quebec, put an $85 million private placement in at a 10% premium to market. So, you know, great shareholder. Uh, and Quebec is the most proactive mining government in the world. Uh, they, they're the only ones that actually will write a check, a government check to be equity partners with you. Uh, so we have a home court advantage of being what I believe is the best mining jurisdiction in the world uh, with the most supportive government. And they own you know, collectively 22% of our company. Um, so, you know, we have we are unique in that we do have a huge shareholder that backs the play. Uh, and they participate with us in different deals. The case of Depot has enough uh, right to participate up to uh, 20% in certain deals, depending on the condition directly with us, which sometimes they do. Uh, so we can talk, uh, we cast a much larger sh uh, shadow than we do. And we've also been able to, uh, to, lay a, to, to, to work debt through directly through the pension plans at lower cost than some of the other uh, groups. So we can bring both equity debt and the royalty money to the table and we're just in the process of maturing that uh, as we go through it in a couple of next steps. But reality is, you know, we've we've been able to position ourselves and it was all about getting those core real estate positions. Um, there was more drilling on our royalty lands uh, last year collectively than there was almost in the rest of the world uh, because Canada was drilling and everybody else was shut down. Uh, so that's a big advantage for shareholders is that every time the drill bit turns on one of our royalty uh, lands and we don't pay for it, it's upside for us. Okay. We've had significant discoveries. Well, do you or the board feel any pressure financially? Because I know uh, you, you just got Investissement Quebec to put that money in as equity. Is that what's driving the confidence here? Because again, I'm just trying to get back to why aren't investors, you know, some investors behind you with this vision that you have if you've got the financial um you know ability to to um to help you deliver these things yeah so we're actually net debt zero if you look at our cash position plus our equity book mm. uh, so our equity book sits at around 300 million our cash position is slightly over 200 and our net debt position is uh you know there's 350 million dollars in convertibles of uh, which 300 is due in 2022 so it's not exactly next door and then the rest of it's on our acquisition line which we are in the process of using for acquisitions. Um, so we're pretty comfortable with our balance sheet. We try to run a net debt zero basis balance sheet. Um, so that's that's where we sit right now. Um, obviously, one of the big equity positions is the Cisco Mining. It sits over you know, $140, $160 million on a mark-to-market basis. So that's why we're, we're pretty relaxed about where we are. The way that we put the debt on our balance sheet was we did a $1.1 billion acquisition from Orion uh, for a royalty portfolio in 2017. So it was the debt didn't occur because of, of anything except building NAV. Uh, so we got NAV when we did that debt exchange uh, and we built our, our GEOs up to 80,000 uh, ounces a year. So, you know, they're, it's a pretty good ratio when you look at it symmetrically. Uh, in terms of, of the balance of things. And we try to maintain that, you know, close to our positive zero, uh, net debt zero. Um, we will pay back debt as time goes by. We've paid down $350 million of dividends and share back buybacks. Uh, in 2019, uh, we bought back 8% of our stock from Orion with the share exchange of our equity book for $174 million. Uh, so we've been pretty, pretty proactive on our balance sheet management. Okay. But for you know, two point, I'm an old country boy. I don't like that. Well, yeah, no. But for a 2.5 billion dollar company, you know, the, you know, net net zero is, is, you know, is that where you want to be? Well, listen, it depends on why we're putting debt on, right? So, I mean, I'm willing to put debt on if we have producing assets that we're acquiring. Uh, I'm not really, uh, you know, too keen to put debt on in terms of of medium to long term opportunities. But for near term opportunities, that's what acquisition lines are for. And traditionally, you know, the most of the royalty companies do use their acquisition line and convert to debt because it's a tax efficient way to do things. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, you know, we have huge tax pools, we're on shore dominantly, um, but through the Canadian flow through share basis, the reason that we run such a big equity book is that when we purchase those equities, we can use that tax uh, protection that comes with flow through shares uh, to protect our tax pools. And we, you know, we started with $50 million worth of tax pools uh, we've made almost $800 million in revenue on, on shore, uh, and we still enjoy tax pools in excess of $350 million. So tax management is a big thing for us, and we don't have any CRE issues outstanding. 
uh, and we've been able to do a, a model that's a little bit different than others, uh, but highly tax efficient. When we buy equities under the flow through uh, model, if it's federal, it's a minimum of 22% gain. If it's provincial and we happen to be in Quebec, it can be up to 50% uh, premium. So if you pay a dollar for a stock, we own, and we we execute execute the same transaction using flow through, we have only paid a net of 50 cents for the, for the same equity that you bought. So it's a bit unique, a bit complicated, but uh, it saves a huge amount of money for us. And, you know, makes a, a marginal asset look pretty good. You mentioned earlier you changed the management rent last year. What, what happened? Why? Yeah. What happened? Well, listen, you know, we had a lot of the same management team from 2007 um, when we were operating and building a mining company. Everybody got paid out in 2014. Uh, you know, so uh, we had a management team that that largely had had a big win, and uh, and a lot of them wanted to go off and do something else. Uh, and you know, so it was time for a change. And we were, you know, Brian was 62, 63, uh, previous president, and uh, you know, we felt it was time that uh, for a refreshment. And people were talking about our, you know, our our uh, our, our, our plans, and uh, we decided that at the time it was better off to reset, bring Sandeep Singh in. Uh, who's 40, uh, extremely successful investment banker, been on most of the big M&A deals as a boutique I, uh, I banker uh, for the last time, and let him set up his own team and, and handpick the people. And he wanted to come forward with me. Uh, I'm 56, so, you know, I've still got a bit of a kick at the can. Uh, and we've, uh, you know, took the, took the technical team uh, forward with us. Um, but we really wanted to get the, uh, you know, the, the eagerness and the hunger back in the management team and, and a lot of other people just, you know, made enough money, paid for their house and wanted to move on and do something else. So, you know, that that energy level goes down when you've had the big win. Uh, and we wanted to give somebody else a, a, a platform to really take this thing to the next level. And as you know, our business has been changing. It's become much more financial engineering. Um, so we're still pretty good at the primary assets, but we did want to increase our horsepower on the financial engineering level in Sandeep is by far one of the best I've seen of, of, of the next generation of guys. And he's really, I think, going to set the stage uh, for what happens next in our space. Okay. In a gold bull market like this, margins are great. You should, with your producing assets, be throwing off a lot more cash in, in Q3, Q4, COVID conditions allowing. How do you, in your mind, take advantage of this situation? Because up until August, you had a different kind of uh, set of problems. What are your problems going forward? Well, I think, you know, all of our, we, Quebec had uh, instituted a, a shutdown of all the primary assets that we're involved in. So, you know, obviously Canadian Malartic is back up and running. Eleanor is back up and running. These are some of our primary assets. Uh, so we should be in pretty good stead coming through the end of the year to, to throw off a significant amount of cash flow. Um, last year, you know, we had revenues of just under 150 million Canadian uh, and we made $100 million uh, after, after GNA and dividend. Um, so running one of the higher margins and we continue to build cash and pay down debt. And as we move forward, you know, in a, in a bull market, we have to be very strategic uh, about how we do things because it's getting very competitive for royalties. So our, our accelerator model becomes much more important uh, where we're able to incubate stories uh, and put a proper management, both technical and financial together. It's a huge opportunity to have some of those stories that may not be capitalized to be the you know the catalyst investor to come in and then put both the management team, the asset, and you know the pro the appropriate royalty and streaming opportunity in place. So, what we like to do in these markets is, this is when you can create royalties as opposed to streams, is because it's relatively early time, and we need the equity component at that point in time because we know that we're fairly far away from the mine being in production. So we like to make money on the equity positions and harvest those positions to pay for the royalties. You know, much like the Arizona mining story that I cited, where we've got a free ride on the royalty and we've already made $24 million on the equity net of the royalty. So whatever happens to the royalty is, is you know, significant premium. So that's the kind of stories that we're looking for in this upturn. Uh, we're also looking to see some of our development stories actually convert from development into mining uh, with the access, added access to capital that they now have at the higher, higher commodity prices. So how do you describe yourself now? You just talked about financial engineering as, as the way forward. There's nothing wrong with it, yeah, but I think, yeah. what are you? Well, we're, we're probably the best royalty company in the space in terms of business model. The ability to actually execute is there because we have a technical team. So I would say we're, uh, you know, we are different, uh, but we're, we're purpose-built 
uh, for all types of weather. We, we do very well in downturn uh, and then we can harvest like nobody else in the upturn because we have that equity component. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, people need to have a look at the hybrid model. There's a lot of competition in the pure royalty space, uh, which I don't think is healthy. You know, there's a lot of winners regret out there in terms of overpaying for royalties and bank run processes um, that people are looking to lay off in their multiples. You know, if you pay one point a dollar fifty for a dollar's worth of cash flow, and you re, you can you can do an equity financing in a dollar eighty, um, it's not a bad business, but it's not really what I would call a primary business, and certainly nothing that Warren Buffett would invest in, um, because those those premiums could erode. So at the end of the day, you know, we're pretty much a uh, you know a a, a a basic believer in a dollar in dollar out, and to to eat our own cooking as much as possible, rather than get married to other people's. Uh, successes and failures. Okay, so do you think with this new structure, this new look, this uh, you know financial restructuring components, it is smarter. But do you think you've made yourself less attractive to be taken out if that was ever a thing? Well, I think you know I've been a takeout target as long as I can remember, um, and I guess if I'm doing my job properly, it's because I do have you know a significant amount of assets, and uh, I think if you talk to most investment bankers, they would say that you know. Cisco has a, a valuation gap that's attractive to, to both mining companies because we hold the keys to several uh, Porsches in the in the in the gold deposit asset base, uh, as well as we have one of the best royalty portfolios uh, out there, and we're the fourth largest in the world. So you know, if you're the top three, um, you don't you know you'd obviously look at number four before you looked at number five. Um, and the jurisdiction and the longevity of the assets that we have, like the Canadian Arctic royalty. Um, you know, the LNR royalty and, and the Victoria royalty um, are more than enough to justify the cur- current NAV underpinning of the company. So I do feel like we are a takeover target every time, every day of the week. Um, and we govern ourselves accordingly. And, you know, as, as people saw the last time when Gold Corp went hostile on us, they bid two and a half billion dollars. At the end of the day, we sold the company for four point three billion. Uh, so for that reason alone, I think shareholders need to own a company like this. Uh, if you are focused on the takeover target, we are the number one takeover target in the space, uh, but we are guaranteed that we will get you paid. Um, if somebody does come at us, we will drive for value. Um, and that's the nature of life at the waterhole. Some days you're the lion, some days you're the zebra. Uh, so, 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 some days the zebra kicks the lion in the head. But <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen it happen. Um, so talk, talk to me about you, who you rely on because as I say, this seems to be segueing into a different sort of morphing into a different sort of company, which means that you're attracted to that. Who's going to actually manage the build out of these, you know, or these development plays that you've got uh, investments into? Have you got any energy or appetite for that? Well, I think where we sit is that Luke Lassard's our chief operating officer. And, you know, Luke was the mine builder for Cambior. Cambior built 20 mines. His dad built 20, 10. He built 10. Then he built more. Um, so that's really, you know, Luke wakes up in the morning as he tells me, Sean, I love the smell of fresh concrete. Um, so that's his job. <laughs> but you've got 135 royalties, um, only 32 of which are sort of producing or near term producing. Yeah. There's a lot in the, in, the, in the background. So what happens with that? What is the model going forward? You, you can offload some of those? Well, you know, a lot of those assets were purchased as sort of portfolios, you know, kind of when you buy like a cable TV package, you wanted to get the... Uh, you wanted to get the football and all of a sudden you got Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg on the cooking channel um, as, a, as, a, as part of your package. So, you know, we don't really ascribe a lot of value to some of those sleeper royalties. Right. Uh, they are a nice call, a nice potential. But, you know, we have 16 producers right now, which is, is more than most of the rest of the sort of mid-tier smaller royalty companies. Um, and we see, you know, that growth going to sort of 2021 over the next three to five years. And a lot of that's organic growth out of the portfolio of companies that we've incubated. We've incubated seven companies now, starting with the Cisco Mining, Windfall Lake, Falco Resources, uh, which has an exceptional deposit located in Rua Naranda. It's 9.1 million ounces gold equivalent with 6.1 of it in reserves. Um, the Barkerville Assets and then, uh, you know, Victoria was, a, was an accelerator company. Uh, and then things like uh, Talisker Resources in British Columbia, Sable Resources, uh, and, and the other sort of companies that come along. And we, we try to incubate one of those companies per year. Um, we don't, we, you know, we assumed that the success rate would be one in three. So far, we haven't had a failure. 
um, which has been exceptional. And we've generated over 21 million ounces of discoveries in four and a half years uh, at the drill bit from those companies that our shareholders have royalties on. So it's been an exceptional success, but it's going to take another probably six to 12 months before the bigger market gets there. And, you know, we'll see some of these newer mining, these new royalty companies sort of have their euphoria. A lot of them are spin outs of, of asset bases that basically went no bid from the traditional royalty and streaming companies. So they spun them out um, and put a, you know, some, some, uh, some management teams in place that really don't, you know, don't come from the royalty space and they we'll see how they do in the long term. Okay, well, let's, let's let's talk about that. Are you look, are you looking over your shoulder at any of these guys? Well, you seem to be looking over your shoulder with some kind of disdain uh, about what they've managed to put together. But the no, market, the market, the market's valuing them. Yeah, I think it's indicative the market wants to pay for them. So you know, well done, lads, and and you know that's you know we we appreciate that success in the, in the mining business in any form is something I'm going to celebrate. Um, you know, it's been a tough space as you as you said in the beginning. Um, so I have uh, I have no disdain for any success in our industry. Um, I'm only there to clap and support, and you know. But I mean, our business model is that uh, you know we're we're there to offer that sort of uh, uh, steady build of asset base and 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 give a brownfield Canadian component to it, um, which is really our specialty. Uh, and you know, we'll uh, we'll continue to grow the way we grow. And you know, these the next six to twelve months is kind of crucial that. You know, we get Barkerville sorted and, uh, and 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 to the next leg. I think that'll that'll take some of the pressure off. And I think that when people see our year-end results uh, as we come through this, you know, we had a few assets that uh, that became problem children through the you know, Ryan action transaction with Lydian, uh, obviously having some issues in Armenia, uh, the diamond market getting some brain damage uh, uh, in terms of commodity pricing. So you know, all these things they come through and. When you have a portfolio of assets, this is inevitable that you have some problem, some okay. problems in your portfolio. But we do have a broad portfolio. Okay. What I'm trying, what I'm trying, I'm trying to understand. I'm an investor, a family office. I'm trying to work out which, you know, royalty companies I should be into. I think what you're, what I'm hearing from you is you're, you believe in fundamentals, and you're saying not necessarily a big believer in some of the promotion that's going on elsewhere, and you need time to deliver the new strategy. Do you need, what do you think you need to show the market in the next 12 months? Answer me that. I think the, uh, you know, the evolution, the big, the big uh, re-rating that we haven't seen so far has been the Malartic Underground as Agnico continues to actually own that. Um, there was a lot of crosstalk in the marketplace about whether, you know, Agnico and Yamana were going to try and force us to take a reduced royalty uh, on the underground component or not. Obviously, at current gold prices, that's not a discussion. Um, and then they've recently come forward to this last quarter with their exploration and development program. So I think that's a pretty primary piece of, you know, steady eddy, uh, no risk, like Nico and Yamana uh, pushing hard to develop that underground that goes directly into our asset base. The other big one will be, you know, the sort of the evolution of what we do with Parkerville um, as North Spirit evolves and we have, you know, we'll get that done by the end of the year. And uh, we should, you know, we should see some pretty steady uh, re-rate as we come forward. And uh, Sandeep gets more and more, uh, you know, known to the market. And uh, hopefully we get a couple of deals done um, that are that are in the hopper now. And we can, you know, we can move on to the next level uh, of, of the business. Um, but what, what's your brief to him, Sean? Model. What's your brief to him, Sean? You know, you, you said, right, we, we've kind of, we need some more energy in here. You're great financial yeah engineer but what's it what's the brief that you've given him to sort your company out well i think where we are is you know the separation of the of, of the model which was you know the accelerator company we had said that we would do that with north spirit and we were obviously we ran into COVID 19 here in the spring uh so you know we're probably a quarter behind on the evolution of that but you know we'd said 25 percent of our AUMM was going to go into the accelerator model and 75 percent was going to go into you know, traditional last money in strategy, if you will, um, which is, you know, shovel ready, permanent hand, uh, mine finance is typically where streams and royalties uh, play out. Um, there was a period in 2016 where then, you know, the big companies, the base metal companies were using streams to refinance their debt packages, but that was probably a once off. I mean, that's super cheap now. So we're back to traditional royalty and streaming business, which is mostly project finance. And now that we've incubated these seven companies, a lot of them have moved from the 25% allocation to the 75% allocation. So 
there needs to be separation for lack of a better metaphor of church and state within our group. We're in the process of executing that. Um, and, you know, we want to create that, uh, that pool of capital that comes to work with us uh, to make sure that these assets that we incubated in the 25% component transition to production and become producing royalties and streams and to purify the royalty and streaming business, as we always said we would, once we'd sort of got, you know, the cake baked, um, that we would we would move on and we would create that side car of capital that was more focused on the development space. I think we're a little bit in the penalty box, you know, for having some of our, our capital allocated into that development space. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we got the message. We're going to do it. Uh, Sandeep's the man to lead the charge. And, you know, I will make sure that the mines get built so that the royalty and streams actually become uh, part of the revenue stream for the company. That's my job. You know, I, I've I spent my whole life building mines. Um, it's not something that's foreign to me. It's not, you know, I'm not putting down my laptop to pick up my hammer. Uh, I was born with the hammer in my hand. So I'll make sure that portion happens and we'll let Sandeep, uh, you know, focus on making sure that we run the best royalty company in the world. Okay. Separation of church and state. I love it. Simplicity of message as well. I, I, I like it. Look, I get, it sounds like he's got his uh, got a bit of work to do. You know, get his feet under the table and uh, start delivering. Hopefully, in a COVID free, COVID nineteen yeah. free zone uh, soon as well. Look, Sean, I appreciate the run through. First time we've met. First time we've spoken. First time I've heard that story. Um, it, it's complex, but I understand it better now. Um, you've got a lot of good moving parts. Um, let's see what this year brings you. Well, I would also add, you know, as a group, uh, we've returned capital to shareholders many times. The last time we built Canadian Arctic, we were at 4.3 million ounces gross revenue, and we spent 1.2 billion to make shareholders 3 billion net. So that's the plan. <laughs>